Ever since the beginning of Russian aggression towards Ukraine in 2014, but especially following the full-scale invasion in February of 2022, a debate has reignited over Ukraine's decision to renounce its nuclear arsenal, inherited from the Soviet Union at the time of independence. For a period of several years in the early 1990s, Ukraine was technically the third most heavily armed nation in the world, with thousands of nuclear warheads stationed on its territory. And yet, by the end of 1994, Kyiv had publicly renounced those weapons, transferring their control to the Russian Federation. While some in the present day declare this renunciation a grave mistake, the decision-making process by which this happened was deemed both logical and expedient at the time, even if tortuous in nature. This is a look at Ukraine's road to denuclearization and the 1994 Budapest Memorandum. This video is made possible thanks to the generous support of our YouTube members and patrons. Their contributions are the backbone of our work. As a token of our appreciation, our patrons and YouTube members enjoy two exclusive videos every week. Currently, they have access to a complete series on Xenophon's Anabasis, the First Punic War, History of Prussia, Italian Unification Wars, Risorgimento, and numerous other fun videos. Additionally, our Pacific War series is ongoing, and we're excited to announce the release of a new series on the Russo-Japanese War and Albigensian Crusades, and much more, exclusively for our backers. If you want to join this fantastic community, you can find the links in the video description and pinned comment. By becoming a patron or YouTube member, you'll gain access to exclusive videos, early access to all our public content, release schedules, wallpapers, and an invitation to our active Discord server, where we engage in lively discussions. Your support is invaluable, and we sincerely thank you for making our work possible. The collapse of the Soviet Union in December of 1991 witnessed the emergence of newly independent states, each of which inherited and assumed control over all the assets in their respective territories. There was little dispute over the right of these new states to these claims, except in one rather significant area, nuclear weapons and their associated strategic equipment. From the ruins of the Soviet Union came four nuclear states, the Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, Belarus and Ukraine. While Kazakhstan, Belarus and Ukraine were free to make their own independent choices in what international treaties and groups they wanted to join, Russia was recognized as the direct inheritor of all of the Soviet Union's former international obligations, including things like the permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council, but also for its international treaty obligations, including arms control agreements like the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT. One of the defining features of the Cold War period was the extensive nuclear arsenals possessed by both the United States and the Soviet Union, with significantly smaller stockpiles held by the United Kingdom, France and the People's Republic of China, who conveniently held the veto-wielding UN Security Council seats. One of the overriding fears among all of these nations was that their controlled and therefore ostensibly safe nuclear monopoly would be lost allowing nuclear weapons to spread and destabilize global security as a result. To this end, the Non-Proliferation Treaty was signed in 1968. Signatory states recognized the five nuclear weapon states and pledged themselves as Non-Nuclear Weapon States, or NNWS. The NPT crucially gave no possibility of a state that physically possessed nuclear weapons but did not want to be a nuclear state. In the 1960s, such a thing simply didn't exist. With the NPT in force from 1970 onwards, it formed the bedrock of all nuclear arms negotiations that followed, including the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which came into effect in 1988, as well as the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, which was signed on July 31, 1991 by the United States and the Soviet Union, but had not yet been ratified when the Soviet Union collapsed. The signing of the Belovezh Accord on December 8, 1991, brought an end to the Union Treaty that had formed the Soviet Union, but it can be overlooked that, at the same time, it created the CIS, the Commonwealth of Independent States, although it was unclear at the time if it was supposed to act as an administrative aid towards the full independence of the signatory republics, or as a structure to replace the Soviet Union with the signatory republics still tied to Moscow at the centre. Key to what was to unfold was Article 6 of the Belovezh Accord, 
which stated that member states of the Commonwealth shall preserve and maintain under joint command a common military strategic space, including control over nuclear weapons. This was followed by a CIS meeting in the Kazakh city of Almaty a few weeks later, on the 21st of December, where Commonwealth states all pledged to nuclear non-proliferation and agreed to the removal of any tactical nuclear weapons to Russia by July 1st, 1992, and that the use of nuclear weapons could only be authorized by the President of Russia with the agreement of the other Commonwealth states. Under this agreement, Russia remained in de facto control of the former Soviet nuclear arsenal. The newly independent nation of Ukraine emerged from the dust of the Soviet Union in possession of not just a formidable nuclear arsenal, but also a substantial amount of the key infrastructure involved in retaining a nuclear force. Regarding the strategic weapons Ukraine had on its territory at the time of independence, there were 176 intercontinental ballistic missiles, made up of 46 ultra-modern SS-24 scalpel missiles in hardened silos, as well as 130 SS-19 stiletto systems, with a total of 1,240 warheads available between them both. Additionally, there were 44 strategic bombers, 19 supersonic Tupolev Tu-160 blackjacks, and 25 Tupolev Tu-95 bears. These could be armed with KH-55 air-launched cruise missiles, or ALCMs, for which Ukraine had up to 598 warheads available. There were also 2,883 tactical weapons in Ukraine, spread across multiple different delivery platforms. However, it was not only the warheads and the delivery systems that Ukraine had on its territory, it also had a variety of nuclear research facilities and a major missile design and manufacturing facility, in addition to a storage facility that held up to 300 kilograms of highly enriched uranium, or HEU. However, what Ukraine crucially lacked was facilities to conduct maintenance on the warheads, or access to the command and control systems, which were naturally centralized in Moscow. The early days of Ukrainian independence were marked by the rapid creation of multiple national institutions, including a military that was separate from Russia. But initially, there was no consideration of Ukraine remaining a nuclear power. There was a deep antipathy towards anything nuclear in the country, largely the result of the 1986 Chernobyl disaster. Initial steps began to be taken for Ukraine to declare itself a neutral country and join the NPT as a non-nuclear weapons state. This position was met well by Russia, but even more so by the United States. Washington's interest and motivation to ensure a denuclearized Ukraine was fueled by several tracks. One was the fear that a nuclear-armed post-Soviet version of the Yugoslav Wars of Independence would occur. The other was that the ratification of the START Treaty, seen as one of the major capstones of George Bush's foreign policy, would either be delayed or derailed. This was going into an election year, after all. START had been negotiated as a bilateral treaty between the United States and the Soviet Union as a way to greatly reduce nuclear stockpiles, no more than 6,000 warheads per side, to a maximum of 1,600 ICBMs and strategic bombers. Initial American proposals to find a solution that would accommodate the three new nuclear states began with the idea that Russia would be declared the sole possessor of all the nuclear weapons on former Soviet territory, and that the new nations would accommodate inspection regimes as part of the START treaty. Needless to say, Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan rejected this as both a violation of their own sovereignty as well as a denial of ownership to weapons they considered their property. It wasn't, however, that they aimed to keep these weapons for themselves, but rather that they aimed to negotiate fair compensation for their removal. By April of 1992, an agreement had been reached. All four of the new states – Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia and Ukraine, as well as the United States – would be signatories to start, and in exchange, Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan would join the NPT as non-nuclear weapon states. This understanding was signed into fact in May of that year in what became known as the Lisbon Protocol. This included Article 5, which stated, The Republic of Belarus, the Republic of Kazakhstan and Ukraine shall adhere to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons of the 1st of July 1968 as non-nuclear weapon states parties in the shortest possible time and shall begin immediately to take all necessary action to this end in accordance with their constitutional practices. 
While the Lisbon Protocol allowed Start to move forward, it failed to resolve one of the key issues that was about to emerge, that of ownership of the nuclear weapons themselves. With the signing of the Lisbon Protocol, both Belarus and Kazakhstan gave up any claims to ownership over the nuclear weapons on their territory. Ukraine, on the other hand, looked instead for formal security guarantees over its territorial sovereignty in exchange for giving control of its weapons to Russia. Kyiv viewed themselves as remaining both owners and in control of the strategic weapons on its territory until they were handed over to Russia. Moscow, however, viewed the signing of the Lisbon Protocol as Ukrainian acceptance of Russian ownership. The formal security guarantees that Ukraine was seeking came as a result of the quickly growing tensions between Moscow and Kyiv over things such as the ownership of the Black Sea Fleet and the status of Crimea itself. Ukraine was seeking from the nuclear weapons states, especially Russia and the United States, a guarantee that the powers will never use nuclear weapons against Ukraine, never resort to conventional force or the threat of force, will abstain from economic pressure in a controversy, and respect our territorial integrity and the inviolability of borders. The United States, however, refused to commit to any such guarantees beyond the loose ones outlined in the NPT, which pledged to provide or support immediate assistance in accordance with the United Nations Charter to any NPT non-nuclear weapon state threatened with aggression involving nuclear weapons or which is the victim of such aggression. The vagueness of this statement, which lacked concrete obligations, was of major concern to Ukraine. It is extremely important to note that Ukrainians at the time the Lisbon Protocol was signed, beyond a small group within the Rada, had no plans or considerations for keeping any of the nuclear weapons on their territory. The question, which Lisbon failed to address, was on what forms of compensation Ukraine was going to receive in exchange for handing over the weapons. Ukraine wanted four main things. One, the recognition that Ukraine rightfully owned the strategic forces in its territory. Two, a firm commitment of American technical assistance funds to cover the costs of disarmament. Three, the return to Ukraine of the uranium and plutonium from dismantled weapons for reuse in civilian reactors or for resale. And four, robust security guarantees from the United States and the other nuclear powers. President Bush and his advisors, having gotten the Lisbon Protocol to allow START to go forward, were less interested in further commitments directly to Ukraine, preferring to fall back to their Cold War comfort zone of dealing directly with Moscow, and things appeared to be at an impasse. Meanwhile, the warheads still positioned in Ukraine were becoming more of a challenge. The warheads themselves required regular maintenance in order to ensure their safety, and the only facilities available to conduct this maintenance were in the Russian Federation. This meant that Ukraine was under a deadline to come to an agreement or risk compromise warhead safety, a second Chernobyl as it was referred to in the Russian press. Although some Ukrainians began to advocate for keeping the nuclear weapons and becoming a nuclear weapons state, there were numerous reasons why this was not realistic, largely financial. Billions of dollars would need to be invested to complete an independent missile development program, including uranium and plutonium processing facilities, maintenance facilities, a command and control system for the missiles themselves, as well as an independent satellite system to provide targeting. They would have also had to arrange for a test site, something that would have been incredibly difficult to do. The cost of all of this, at a time when the Ukrainian economy was in a state of collapse, was simply not feasible, let alone wise. There was a key technical argument as well against Ukraine keeping these nuclear weapons as a deterrent, and that was about who the weapons were supposed to deter. The Russian Federation was seen as the most likely rival, but the vast majority of nuclear weapons in Ukraine were designed to strike targets in the United States. They were not designed as short or intermediate range weapons, and their capability to hit targets inside those ranges was highly error-prone. The result of this for Ukraine was that some were advocating spending billions to keep weapons to deter a potential rival that the weapons were wholly ineffective against. 1993 was a mixed year. Ukraine saw an increased desire to come to an arrangement. Russian nationalists like Zhirinovsky began to vocally call for the eradication of Ukrainian nationhood, and Boris Yeltsin's inability to control Russia's volatile political landscape increased Kyiv's determination to obtain its security objectives. But it also knew that the window to meet its goals was closing. 
Tensions between Kyiv and Moscow were escalating over such issues as the fate of the Black Sea Fleet and Ukraine's increasing unpaid debt to Russia over oil and gas transfers. With Bill Clinton's victory in the US presidential race, however, a new opportunity presented itself. The new administration had concluded that relying on Moscow to act as the primary agent of change in the region was not yielding results and that more direct engagement with the successor states was necessary, particularly Ukraine. To that end, the American Secretary of Defense, Les Aspin, traveled to Kyiv and agreed to an increase in available funds to help disable and dismantle Ukrainian weapons through the CTR, or Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, itself a part of the Soviet Nuclear Threat Reduction Act, known as the Nunlugar Act, which had been passed by the US Congress in December 1991 with an aim to help dismantle Soviet arms. Despite its minimal impact on the overall challenge, this agreement to increase available funds directly to Ukraine was enough to spark a resumption of dialogue. Behind the scenes, an agreement between Russia and Ukraine was made for a compensation plan for warheads in Ukraine, which would be transferred to Russia. Despite this progress, Ukraine was still insistent on receiving security guarantees from the nuclear powers, especially the United States. But what did security guarantees mean? To the Ukrainians, it meant protected and enforced neutrality, similar to the deal that Austria had been given following the Second World War. The Americans, however, viewed it as something akin to NATO's Article 5, which would oblige the United States to intervene on Ukraine's behalf in the event of an attack. As direct engagement between Washington and Kyiv increased, Moscow started to become concerned over the growing relationship worrying in part that too many Russian military secrets would be revealed to the Americans. Kravchuk in Ukraine was also eager to broker a deal with Moscow, knowing that Yeltsin's government was easier to negotiate with than the growing strength of the Russian nationalists in the Duma. In June of 1993, Kravchuk and Yeltsin signed a technical process agreement on future transfers, and this was followed in August by a US-brokered trilateral agreement to be signed in September. At the last minute, however, the agreement fell apart, the result of a failure to acknowledge that the Ukrainians believed they were agreeing to transfer only the SS-19 missiles, while the Russians and the Americans understood the agreement to include the ALCMs and the SS-24s. Warren Christopher, the American Secretary of State, allowed for a further increase in CTR funding in October of 1993, on the condition that it applied to all nuclear weapons in Ukraine. There was an uncertain goal in this move, beyond maintaining engagement, which was deemed crucial. The plan worked, as a deal was then brokered on the transfer of high-enriched uranium and low-enriched uranium from dismantled warheads using the United States as a broker. As all of this was occurring, however, domestic opinion in Ukraine, as reflected in the Rada, was shifting away from the idea of Ukraine becoming a non-nuclear weapons state and instead continuing to hold the weapons in order to get further concessions from the West and from Russia, or even for keeping them and Ukraine declaring itself a nuclear weapons state. With this shifting opinion, Rada was refusing to ratify Ukrainian participation in START. Clinton made the decision to intervene personally with Kravchuk, who himself was attempting to distance himself from the position taken by the Rada. A December 1993 agreement saw Kravchuk, Clinton and Yeltsin agree to dismantle all of Ukraine's SS-24s, Russia to compensate Ukraine for the nuclear fuel from the warheads, the start of transference of Ukrainian warheads to Russia by March of 1994, Russian supply of nuclear fuel assemblies for Ukrainian nuclear power plants, and an agreement that Russia would continue to service Ukrainian warheads. This was signed into being as the trilateral agreement in January of 1994. The Rada took the news hard. It was at this point that Kravchuk played all of his political cards and made an impassioned and direct plea to the Rada, pointing out that Ukraine lacked operational control of the weapons, meaning that they had no real deterrent value, that Ukraine had no independent ability to maintain the weapons, that Ukraine had no money to build or test new weapons, and most importantly, that expired warheads were already being transferred to Russia to ensure their safety, and that by refusing to agree to anything now, they would be left with nothing later. The result of this move was, at last, the Rada agreeing to ratify the START treaty, although they did refuse to join the NPT in the same vote, mostly as an act of defiant posturing. 
the transfer of SS-24 systems began in March. Ukrainian elections that same month saw Kravchuk ousted from power and replaced by Leonid Kuchma, whose background was in the administration of Soviet rocket manufacturing. Kuchma leveraged this background to continue Kravchuk's work. He convinced the Rada that a refusal to join the NPT was counterproductive, as it not only set Ukraine outside the international order at a time when it desperately needed outside assistance, but that the denuclearization process was already too far along for any meaningful halt to be made. The Rada acquiesced and agreed to join the NPT on the condition that there was a recognition that the strategic weapons had been Ukrainian and not Russian. Russia conceded to language that acknowledged that Ukraine was joining the NPT as a state that did not possess nuclear weapons. On December 5, 1994, US President Bill Clinton, UK Prime Minister John Major, Russian President Boris Yeltsin and Ukrainian President Leonid Kuchma met in Budapest, Hungary and signed the Memorandum on Security Assurances in connection with Ukraine's accession to the NPT, otherwise known as the Budapest Memorandum. With the signature, Ukraine formally gave up possession of the nuclear weapons it had claimed and pledged itself to a non-nuclear future. The Budapest Memorandum has sometimes been remarked on as a failure for Ukraine, as the new state did not get the security assurances it desperately wanted, beyond those pledged in the NPT itself. The language of the NPT only obliges signatory states to provide assistance in the event of a nuclear threat, and even then, with no defined explanation of what the assistance would be. In light of Russian aggression towards Ukraine since at least 2014, but especially since February of 2022, many have called the denuclearization of Ukraine a mistake. However, from the flow of events, it becomes quite clear that Ukraine never had any real prospects of being able to keep the nuclear arsenal it had inherited, and even if it had, its effective deterrence value against its neighbor would have been minimal at best. Ukraine's course of action, even its reluctance, was done in order to gain the best financial deal that it could during an extremely complicated and difficult transition period. More videos on this topic are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.